So um, my job is to try and focus in this last session on uh, connecting with each other. <laughs> I was leaving my house this morning and uh, Anthea said to me, so what are you going on about today? <laughs> Appreciate your encouragement. And I said, uh, great connections with one another. She looked at me, she said, what well, you? <laughs> yes, yeah, me. She said, that, well, good luck with that. <laughs> um, I'm glad to talk about this, and one of the things that I want to do is, given that uh, in our world today we are uh, ministering across a kind of set of different subcultures, and one of the things that I thought it would be good for you to do would be to hear a little bit um, from our brother Sheldon uh, in Uganda about how togetherness in the church there is important to them. And uh, Sheldon, we're delighted that you can be <coughs> here with us today. I remember well speaking at your youth convention uh, last year and Alice uh, you're most welcome uh, as well and uh, it was a pleasure to be in your home with you and, and um, we're so glad you can be here with us Sheldon so um, here's the thing um, you come over to the UK and you see the kind of resources that we have uh, despite the fact we're always banging on about it uh, comparatively speaking we have quite a lot of money and funds and assets and all that kind of thing and, and one of the things about that is that there, in a sense, the, the fact that, you know, we can kind of carry on as we are, can mean that we're not quite as strongly valuing of, of what sociologists call solidarity or, or togetherness, I guess. Say a little bit about how that works uh, in your diocese, where resources are far scarer, and, and I wondered whether or not you needed each other more there. Uh, thank you, um, Bishop Mike, and it's really a, a, a joy for me to be here with my dear wife, and uh, I appreciate the link between Uganda and Bristol, diocese, and call it diocese, and other dioceses, and there is a lot for us that we do learn from here, and which we take home. <laughs> and I had an opportunity also to study from England, Leeds, and there is a lot I learned which has helped me in my ministry. How I pray that probably you also will learn some things which probably can help you also to improve your ministry. But talking about resources and um, ministry and community, I think the video we started with had in that very good expression to be known is to be loved, to be loved is to be known. I think ministry is all about uh, people. People. Before you talk about resources, it's the people, it's the ultimate. And everybody there would love to be loved, even the most tough, difficult. I remember your testimony. You wouldn't be here <laughs> with your testimony, with your background. But you can see how you, you ended up even being a bishop. So, the issue is people out there need to be loved, to be reached, and if we can look for ways and means of how to reach them, since we have been called, elected, and that is a big, big challenge to trouble us enough. Here I am, send me. You have presented yourself, so what is the Lord telling you? How do you reach out? So when we concentrate on that, and we are done having the resources, even the sky can't be the limit for now. Yeah, and so um, I, I remember, uh, was it the year before last, um, I, I had no idea what I was coming to actually, but the kind of provincial clergy conference. Yes. And um, one thing I remember is that they got 900 people booked in and three and a half thousand people showed up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. If only that would happen here. <laughs> and, and you were there to manage here. Yeah. And uh, 
Good, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> so, um, so one of the things that, that I really liked, and this is kind of part of your cultural thing here, but I, I love to see the way African clergy relate to one another when they're together. There seems to be, uh, somebody was talking earlier, weren't they, about uh, we can be a little joyless here, we can be a little stiff. Uh, I love to see, you know, I see a clergy walking around together enjoying each other's company. Um, it's been quite a threat to me as a kind of Englishman, you know, seeing them holding hands and stuff like that. <laughs> and, um, and, um, um, moving on. Um, uh, it just feels like, for you, there is a kind of power of togetherness there that, that sometimes I think is lacking. I was just reflecting on a meeting with the House of Bishops last week but, uh, in this country. But do you, do you feel that? Do you feel that your sense of being together in, in your diocese is a really important thing? I think it mainly comes from the history of our diocese, which has mainly been rooted in the East African revival, which actually happened as a result of uh, an Englishman, Dr. Joe Church, who was a medical doctor, had an interaction with the Ugandan, Simon Sibambi in Rwanda. Then there was that revival which uh, Dr. Um, oh, <laughs> Alston was talking about, the Trinity Lady. Sorry, continue. <laughs> that revival, it's been the history. Actually, this year we are going to celebrate 80 years of revival. So that revival really has kept, has brought about that unity and harmony spirit. And we always try to rekindle it and revive it. And so such that Christianity is not just uh, a court you put on. It is something deep. It, 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 it is deep in there. So, as a result of that, we try to, 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 to base on our Christian teaching, even much more than the culture, to love one another and share with one another. When we meet, like here, in two, three minutes, I would have told you all my problems, and you would know them. <laughs> and you can help me. We pray about it. We get a solution. So, you are free to share. Free to share not guarded. I think that that comes from the, uh, the Christian experience of revival. Uh, when the Christians were together, like in Acts, shared everything together, uh, ate together, and yeah. I think that's where it comes from. So, um, it's a big moment. Um, I'm going to invite you. you. I mean, you've been here with this group. You've heard them at work. Mm -hmm. um, as uh, Ugandan Bishop being amongst us today, what would be the one thing that you would want to leave us with, that you would say to us? I think um, I also have an advantage of having stayed here mm -hmm. for four years in Leeds. Uh, and also as a Ugandan Bishop, what I would say is that we need to reach out to people out there in their homes. I loved the video of the old people. When I became a bishop, I was a lecturer in a university, senior lecturer. When I came, I moved around and saw these old people. I, even in Uganda, they, are, they were in isolation, more or less. And what we did, I did statistics. I found out that uh, many had their families, husbands and wives tucked out there. Uh, I asked all the priests to give me data, information about all these old people. I found that we had about 200 couples who had made 50 years and above in marriage, holy matrimony, 200 couples. That was amazing. And I wrote an article about it in the newspapers. They give me, gave me two pages, which doesn't happen. Uh, but it was a story that was captured. Then we also had a thanksgiving service for this couple. And then all their children came, their grandchildren, once they knew that they were coming. And as a result, when the grandchildren come, when the, the, the children come, then you have a congregation, you have more people getting interested in church. That was a very good model. So I think uh, I would urge uh, uh, servants of God 
to reach out, not to wait for people. In Uganda, we also had that problem. In fact, recently we had the statistics, census done, and we found the Anglican Church has dropped a bit by about 0.4 or something. But I want to believe this has not happened in Ankole. I'm trying to get to the deeper statistics, probably in other areas, because in Ankole we've tried to be very careful about reaching out and keeping the revival of fire burning. But even in our country, it is going down. And the Pentecostals, other faith traditions, are very good at reaching out. For us, we wait for people to come, and these reach out. And as a result, the Pentecostal church in Uganda has grown from 0.4 of the population to 4% to 11% of the population. So they've grown up while the Anglican and the Roman Catholic traditional have gone down. But their major weapon, they reach out. They don't wait for people to come. Sheldon, thank you. It's great to see you. Friend, will you give it up for Sheldon? <laughs> in Cambridge at a course um, some of you are going to say you know, a bit late in the day for you Mike but, um, I, on a course uh, helping me to be a better bishop and you know, clearly there's room for improvement all the time and at one point uh, there's a man there who uh, completely voluntarily told us this story and, and his story was that he was brought up a Roman Catholic this is an academic uh, he's brought up a Roman Catholic, and then when he was a young fellow, his um, parents uh, became Seventh Day Adventists. And yeah, I don't know how much you know about Seventh Day Adventists, but I mean, it's basically okay, it's just 24 hours adrift, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and so he kind of, you know, he felt that he had religion shoved down his throat. Seventh Day. And, and he said, you know, I'm really trying. He said, I tried and I tried. And when I got to the age of, he said, I was in my 40s. It's like, I'm done with trying. I'm done with it. And of course, the, the bishops in the room were, you know, a little disturbed to hear such a miserable end to what a you know, but a very honest and and so he then turned on us and said, So why would I join your church? And bishops are looking at the floor, kind of shuffling. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hey, hey, great question. <laughs> and then the Bishop of Liverpool uh, said uh, a master of criticism, in my view, <laughs> said, um, you can come and join us and get to know God and Christ. He said, and wherever people get to know God, justice begins to emerge. And you could tell this guy's heart had skipped a beat. And he said, I could join a church like that. Then he kind of suddenly checked himself and then said, so, you know, how is it? I know so many people who claim to be Christians who seem to, you know, be the opposite of justice, to be honest. Reminded me of that great uh, moment in um, uh, The Simpsons when uh, Bart's been away on the church weekend, you know, and he comes back and the guys down the pub say to him, how's the church weekend? He said, it was great. We all learned to be more judgmental. <laughs> Um, creating connections with each other. It's interesting that my reading of scripture, at least, tells me that there's a kind of macro and micro aspect to this. The micro aspect is, of course, when Paul's talking about unity in the church and relationships, well, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the local church. And friends, you know the truth, um, because you're in local churches, that we've got a way to go with uh, all that. You know, our relationships will never be perfect because the church 
is full of sinners. So sinners who've been forgiven, but nevertheless full of sinners. And things go wrong. And, you know, as Jesus is well known, he said this, where two or three gather, there's bound to be trouble. <laughs> but then I thought, that there's also a kind of macro level. And it's harder to detect. But it, I think it goes like this, that uh, one of the great things uh, about Moses, and I don't know, you know, the older I get, the more I find myself reading those rich Old Testament stories and narratives and seeing meaning in them and seeing a prefiguring of the Gospel that I've never seen uh, before. But if you said to me, what was the greatest thing that Moses achieved? I mean, he did a lot of good stuff, right? But, I think his greatest achievement was, he took 12 very diverse tribes, each with their own identity. You know about the Aaronic and the Levitical tribes and what their significance was for the worshipping cult of Israel. He took 12 tribes, and he managed to get them traveling in one direction. And when you think about that, not least if you're a member of the Church of England in the 21st century, I think you start to appreciate the size of the challenge that he faced and actually managed to achieve. Of course, there were problems along the way. You could open a chapter like Numbers 11. I'd love to preach on this. You know, it's a famous chapter, uh, to use one of the old uh, translations of the Bible's words. It's about the people of God muttering, right? You all know about that. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, you know, we're getting sick of this. You know, they're out in this wilderness, traipsing around. And, and um, you know, we feel like we're going nowhere slowly. And we're quite hungry. And by the way, we're sick of the food, the diet. And, and they're complaining away. And, and uh, you know, it's a great thing that, that happens in that story, if you know it, that um, Moses gets to the point in his leadership where he's saying to God, look, are these my responsibility? I didn't begat them. <laughs> right? Don't know what was going on under the buttons there, but there wasn't any begatting going on. <laughs> And, and um, God just kind of calms him down and says, look, okay, I realize this is a tough call for you. So I'm going to take the spirit I put on you and get 70 elders of Israel, bring them outside the camp. And the spirit came upon them. That's a little bit about what Emma was talking to us about this morning. Then 70 of them got a kind of new connection with God and the life of the community was changed a bit. And I really liked, I can't remember who it was, but it's a really important thing that was said in the discussion group here. It was that we can incline, can't we, to think that it is all about us and about the interventions that we make. That's what my colleague, the Dean, calls the new Pelagianism, thinking it's about what we do that makes the difference. It doesn't mean stop doing stuff. Remember that it doesn't all rest upon you and upon your effort. So the, the kind of um, macro response to walking together, if I can put it like that, is that leadership kind of supplied the ingredients that very diverse people could suddenly start to travel in the same direction. And Moses shows us that that's possible. Then you come flying forward through the centuries to the New Testament. You get into uh, bits like 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And Paul's, uh, I mean, he's talking primarily about giving there. And I'm primarily not talking about giving at the moment. But what Paul says here is, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he said, um, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. See, this was a church that discovered they were not the only church on the planet. 
And that they had some kind of responsibility for other congregations. And chapter 8 and chapter 9, as you well know, kind of develops that. And of course, to us, this is very countercultural, isn't it? Partly because today, I think, you know, do you remember, you remember those words? I, I, do you know, I wish you'd never said them. It, probably some more words of hers I wish you'd never said as well. When Mrs. Thatcher said, there's no such thing as society. I mean, there is a kind of element of truth in that, but the problem was, it seems to me, is we've been endlessly destructive and simply promoted the power and potential of the individual, and there's something in that as well. But the downside of too much emphasis on the power and potential of the individual is that community suffers. I heard Lee Barnes this morning uh, telling us that they're trying to create community because this was his uh, conviction. That's what people are looking for. I could believe that, could you, on the basis of the way we were made, actually. That we were made to be social uh, animals. And so, when you look at the scriptures, you get this micro and macro. I think we spend a lot more time thinking about the kind of micro aspect of that. How do we manage relationships locally in the local church? I was brought up uh, to believe, and I still believe it as a matter of fact, that the local church is the primary unit of mission. But you don't exist on your own. It is interesting to me that the church, when I first came into it, you know, the great way forward was team ministries. And I, uh, my first bishop, I think, must have been at Mount Sinai, I'd come down with some tablets of stone, and on it just read team ministries. And he went for it big time. Do you know what? They really didn't work that well. And a lot of, up and down the country now, team ministries are being dissolved. I wonder what that says about us in one way. But look, the one thing I do know is that what we're attempting in this diocese of creating connections with people who frankly, at many levels, have so many alternative things to do in their lives, so many choices that they have to make. What we're trying to do is really difficult. But I have this sense, and I hope I'm not the only person in the room who feels this, that actually we need to tackle this challenge together. Together. I don't think that means just, you know, can I get my local car? I think, does that mean that we can have any sense of our identity as a diocese. Does it matter to you if you're in Bristol what goes on in Swindon? Does it matter to you if you live in Chippenham? Then does it, do you give a shove about what goes on in our places somewhere else? <laughs> If you work in church house, do you have any sense of being part of that bigger picture of what we're trying to achieve? I would say we made huge improvements with that, incidentally, in recent times. And here's the point, we can only do this together, and the man I told you about at the beginning of my spiel, the man I told you about, basically, uh, is somebody who's been working with uh, the Cambridge Rowing Aid. And um, Cambridge won this year for the first time for a few years. Someone say amen. amen. Someone say hallelujah. <laughs> and, and one of the things that he was making very clear was that two things mattered in that boat. The first thing is solidarity. That people felt, felt needed to feel that what they were doing was a kind of common purpose. With the boat race, not rocket science, is it? 
And the second thing was, they needed to work out how they could row faster than Oxford. They showed us a skip and slip of the 2006 boat race, it's very interesting, where Oxford were overwhelming favourites, and a week before the race, uh, Cambridge sat their cocks. And they invited a woman who had very little experience of coxing an eight. She'd done one or two coxing jobs on the bumps uh, during term time in Cambridge. They, and so they started to row in the race. And it was a bit choppy. And they're going together. And suddenly, this young woman cox steers the Cambridge boat right at the Oxford boat. They come alongside one another. Some rowers in the room, you know this only too well, if rowers touch uh, blades with, the op with their opposition, it's very dangerous. You can get a very bad injury uh, out of that. And Cambridge came right next door to him and then went away and rowed in ahead and, and won the race. And this is not exactly gender-friendly language, but one of the things that this young woman Cox kept shouting at these fellows in the boat was, Come on, boys. It, I, I did have this thought, you know, that if it had been a woman's eight and it had been a bloke sitting in there shouting, come on, girls, I might have been trouble, but <laughs> perhaps only I thought that. <clears throat> and they did it. And suddenly, when the two boats came near to each other, the Oxford crew were very stressed in their rowing. And the Cambridge crew started to row really well and in an unstressed way, very relaxed, looking round their shoulders. And so I suppose my message is very simple, and, and that is, and this is a real challenge for us, you know, I get this, is what responsibility in your local congregation do you take for the other congregations of this diocese? Do you ever give them a thought? And what would that look like? And of course you know that there are all kinds of threats to the unity of the Church of England at the moment. I'm not going to spell those out because I don't want to finish on a negative note. I really don't. But I had this thought, you know, what if we could be the kind of people who, when we thought about the people who we fundamentally disagreed with, could do what Jesus did and give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, I think about that funny little guy, Zacchaeus, who climbed into a tree to go and see Jesus. Guy was hated by uh, the people uh, who he lived amongst and, and ripped off. And that moment when Jesus looked in the tree, it says in the Greek text that Jesus fixed Zacchaeus in his step. Something happened there. And for the first time in his life, I suppose you could say, somebody gave Zacchaeus the benefit of the doubt. And his life was transformed. Some of you are working amongst some people in this culture of ours who have what is rather politely called these days by the professionals, complex personal needs. Do you think they need someone to give them a second chance? third chance, maybe 70 times seven chances. One of the things that uh, psychologists of, of organizations will say is that the, one of the ways that you create solidarity, I suppose it's the Sir Alex Ferguson way of doing things, and that is you constantly identify a common enemy and that draws the people together to fight that enemy. Yeah, you remember those miserable interviews with Sir Alex where he went on and on about, you know, everybody's against us. And I'm not suggesting that we go down that route, but I think what I am suggesting is, and this is a worry for me, that of course what Sir Alex is doing is he's focusing on an enemy outside the tomb. You say, well, okay, we could all focus on the world, the flesh, and the devil. Fair play. What worries me is, that one of the threats to the church at the moment is that some of us, they, that some of them, in other words, our brothers and sisters in Christ, are the main enemy. 
creating connections, I think is only achievable if we can truly connect with each other. Give people the benefit of the doubt. It doesn't mean you can't question them, it doesn't mean you can't argue with them. But if their identity is, as Paul would say, in Christ, can we just make them enemies like that? Second thing is, what does it mean to take responsibility on a, a macro level for the other congregations around you? In Macedonia it meant, not a, a, a congregation with huge resources, that it mattered to them so much the purpose that they served, that they were prepared to give generously because God had been generous in grace to them. See, we talk a lot about grace, don't we? We sing hymns about it, we say amen to prayers about it. It's quite a counterintuitive concept, isn't it, when you unpack it? Grace is God's love for you and for me, even though we don't deserve it. And in a culture of entitlement, in a world where the Protestant work ethic holds pretty firm, the idea of grace, again, is quite a difficult thing for us to grasp. What does it mean to take responsibility? I take it that the primary characteristic that marks a community out from a people group is that in a community, community it is that place where people start to take responsibility for one another. What would it mean for you, the next time the treasurer stands up and prophesies doom, for you to remind him that there's a generous God and a God of grace. And there are people around us who may need our help. It might not just be money, it might be expertise, it might be people resources, it could be a load of things. But I have this feeling that if we're really going to connect with these people we want to connect with, if we really want to grow discipleship, then we've got to take this challenge on together. And not let our differences just tear us apart. What might it look like for you in your locality to begin to take responsibility? I'm not going to answer that for you. But my prayer today is, I have no idea how many of you will leave this auditorium today and be, well, even a bit changed by what you've heard. You've heard it said, and it was well said that, uh, you know, you can read all the books on the planet, you go to all the conferences on the earth, but if it doesn't affect you, what the heck? And I, you know, it's, it's thrilling for me. I mean, my best times, to be completely honestly true, I know that I'm, you know, not that good at relationships and all that stuff, but my, my best times are when I'm with you. Because what you do matters to me. And you do it in a variety of different ways. Some of you do stuff in a way I'm like, where's that coming from? <laughs> but we're in this together. And I hope that we can focus a bit more on that as these years unfold ahead of us. Last, I had such a great life, you know, last day. Saturday I was speaking with the Mother's Union. And I was talking to them about the significance of small beginnings. Now the kingdom. You know, Jesus talked about seeds, didn't he? Mustard seeds. And I think the way God works with us a lot of the time is He sows those small seeds in us. Which have a dynamic of their own. There's kind of potential growth built in them. Put them in the right soil. Expose them to some light and some moisture. And Jesus says that the seed will grow into a tree in which the birds of the air can flourish. As you know, I, I've said this to you many times. I mean, 
It's not that your local church is unimportant. No, I, you know, I go with idols thing. It's the hope of the world. But it's not an end in itself. It's about realizing God's big idea. The idea of a kingdom, not a place. You can't get on a coach and go there. That place where God's sovereign rule exists. And it mostly exists in hearts. And when those hearts decide they're going to do things together, then the tree flourishes. And parts of the creation unimaginable find their home. And find acceptance. Find belonging and find in the case of birds in trees, find a place they can reproduce. If just a handful of you feel a seed has been sown in your heart, whatever it is, might be something that Graham or Emma or Lee or Christine said, don't despise small beginnings. Because if you will allow the Holy Spirit to, God could change you and change your outlook and your mindset today. I long for a church where my grandchildren can thrive. I long for a church where the elderly are looked after. I love, you know, part of my testimony was, you know, I told the people in Africa this, you know, I, I was a criminal. I was a good criminal. I never got caught. <laughs> and the grace of God saved me. I believe in the God of second chances. And if the God of second chances cannot change our heart, that we can give, we cannot give even people who are in the church a second chance. I'm not sure what hope there is for us. Small beginnings. I'd like to go home with that question there. This guy Mark put before the bishops, why would anybody join your church? I don't know what you'd say. I've been to some of them. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm hoping today, at any time, even if it's in conversations over lunch, whatever, some of you have had a God moment and the one thing I would pray for all of you is you've not become so resistant to that kind of thing happening to you that it could never happen. You know, blessed are those who expect little because they're not going to be disappointed. <laughs> I hope your heart may skip to be. And you understand you're part of bigger than something which is about you and about your local church. You're about a movement in this part of the world that could make a massive change if we're prepared to connect together. Give each other the benefit of the doubt and take some responsibility and get on with it. Look, uh, let me ask you this. Have you had a good time today? Yes. Yes. Good. Uh, and I, I do want to say, um, it's been a, a revelation to me how brilliantly uh, people have organized this day for us. I was feeling much. <laughs> yeah, I was feeling it because I thought, you know what, this could take three and a half hours. And, you know, I'm always, I, you know, I was always taught in our home, you know, family hold back. So, you know, I end up with the... Uh, Roast vegetable sandwich or something like that. <laughs> I really don't like it. Uh, I do want to say thank you to uh, my colleagues and I hope friends in Church House for their time and their effort. Uh, say also that um, the fact that um, the fact that 
our speakers have come and fed us so generously and so uh, liberally with their time. It, you know, it's not like um, Graham and Emma don't have day jobs. <laughs> And uh, I'm really grateful to the pair of you, not just for your input, but for hanging out with us uh, for a day. You have no idea uh, what that means for us. <laughs> and, and just finally, you know, I told you, and I really mean this, um, I, I really love the opportunity of hanging out with you. And this, this kind of thing means more to me than you will ever know. And that means that my last thank you is to you. Because you put up with a lot. And these are difficult days uh, in the churches. You know, people now, I think, can be very incendiary. I don't know whether new media creates that, you know, but quickly resort to kind of extreme accusation and not very nice language. Um, but, and, you know, we, I'm, I never start out, you know, I'm always wary when we have a clergy conference and, and, you know, we start out by trying, you know, saying to you, you know, you're all really, you know, we know you're all really depressed and sick. <laughs> and, you know, God help you, friends. I don't like that. I, I don't assume that at all. But I know, because I've talked to some of you, there are struggles. And friends, I never knew a work of God that didn't go through desperate struggle. And in many, many cases, came within a hair's breadth of somebody giving up. And please, you're here today because you've not given up yet. And I thank you for that. And I pray that God will give you the grace and the strength to carry on. And let's see what happens. In the name of our wonderful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the people said, Amen. Frank's friendship is very gracious and mostly conscious. My time to sit down. <laughs>